right. Hey, KubeCon, day three. Do you still have some energy? <laughs> Woo, thank you for being here. Um, yeah, yes. Last night I was at the jazz game, tie until the last second. So, yeah. I hope we can uh, share some good knowledge with you till the last time. So, our topic today is about Kubernetes on multi site, but it's really about designing application and Kube infrastructure. So, it's highly available and resilient. So before we begin, I have a, a small quiz for you. Does anybody know about these little characters? I guess there is no French in the room, so. <laughs> there is one. Oh, really? So these are uh, uh, little people who live on the other planet, and uh, what they do all day is uh, pumping to solve issues, and one of their mantra is, why making it simple when it can be complex? And dealing with cube, Quite often, I, I have that feeling. So I'm Florian, working for Dell Technologies in the product management team for every DevOps um, we do at Dell. I am Jan Schafranek. I work, work at Red Hat on OpenShift storage. And I am a SIG storage de, uh, tech lead upstream. So our main goal today will be to, as much as possible, make Kubernetes on multi-site concept simple well, it can be complicated sometimes. So first, why am I talking to you about these Kubernetes on multi-sites? And working on this presentation, basically, I found that maybe it was the wrong, the wrong title. It's really about designing a app, designing Kube infrastructure, so they are highly available and resilient for your workload and applications. It's really about this. But uh, what do I mean by enabling high availability through multi-sites? So, Within this talk, we're going to have two point of views from the app and from the infrastructure itself. Sorry. Uh, shall it be uh, on prem, thanks to Dell, or in the cloud? So, yes, what do I mean by multi sites anyway? So, usually working with customer on prem again, they tend to have several facilities. You know, site A, site B with dedicated power, dedicated um, rooms, uh, dedicated network, uh, cooling, and so on. And so, you know, having multiple sites enables you to distribute your workload, isolating them and making them more highly available. Usually, two sites is not enough, and you need a third one to avoid uh, split brand scenarios, uh, network partitioning, and you can have a dedicated control plane somewhere else. It can be also with a slightly higher latency. ETCD is pretty tolerant according to the doc with high latency, but over distribution um, by, by vendors like Red Hat, OpenShift distribution recommends you to have all these control planes spread within a fairly low latency uh, infrastructure. So this, this is for the on-prem, but what about clouds? Well, I spend most of my days in the cloud because it's so comfortable to use. And uh, all clouds uh, come with multiple regions. However, the round trip time, round trip time before, between the regions is usually more than 100 milliseconds. It's not that great for multi-site, but every region usually comes with multiple availability zones. And if you read what availability zone is, it is a separate building, separate power, separate cooling, separate networking. So it is a separate site. So if you stretch your cluster among multiple Availability zones in a single cluster, you have highly available, in a single region, you have highly available cluster. So we have highly available Kubernetes cluster. You all read Heroku Manifesto. You all run your applications as stateless, and the state is somewhere else, either in the cloud, in the cloud service, or on prem in a dedicated service somewhere in your data center. So we can, we can finish our talk. Thanks for attending. Unfortunately, people do want to run uh, stateful applications on Kubernetes. And with that comes a little of suffering, a little bit of suffering. We try to easily ease them. Uh, in this, uh, this is a typical deployment of uh, Elasticsearch, but it applies to any modern database. Uh, if you want to make it highly available, you run each Elastic replica in its own site or in its own availability zone. 
Uh, each replica has its own storage that is local to the zone or local to the site because that's the fastest storage you can get. And you want Elastic with a fast storage. And uh, Elastic's job or the application's job is then to replicate its data among its replicas. So when one site goes down or the Elastic pod gets down, the remaining two still have enough data and they can continue providing the service you need. Uh, if you have a more traditional database, every decent database has at least active passive replication. So uh, there is one active, in this case Postgres, that handles all the, all the traffic, all the queries, and it synchronously writes all the data into passive replicas. So when the active dies, uh, one of these passive become active, and again, the service continues. So how can we get into this state with Kubernetes? Multiple replicas, each replica is own volume. Kubernetes provides several objects. You can try deployments. That's the thing that can create multiple replicas of a single pod template. However, very quickly you figure out, figure out that this is not for stateful loads because each replica uses the same storage they will all point to the same storage. That's not what we want. And also, each replica will have a very random name, which uh, makes discovery of the service quite hard. However, if you have a stateful application that counts with that all the replicas share the same storage, for example, in virtualization world, this is fine, even for stateful work workloads. Next thing that uh, Kubernetes provides is a stateful set. Uh, where it can run multiple replicas of the same pod template. Each replica gets its own storage. That's what we want. And also, each replica gets a sta stable name, so you can find it easily on the network. However, uh, state facets are not perfect. We are still improving them. Uh, for example, uh, resizing, if you want to resize a volume in a state facet, you must do it manually right now. And also, state facet is very defensive when it comes to uh, starting a replacement port. When one of, one, one of your nodes become unavailable, then Kubernetes does not know. Is, a, is the node really down, broken, and the application is not running? Or is there just network partitioning and the application is running? Kubernetes is very conservative. It thinks it is still running somewhere, and it doesn't uh, create a rep replacement pod for your Postgres or Elastic or whatever. So it needs to, you need to have an operator or a human person that makes sure that the unavailable node is really shut down, fenced, whatever, and then only after that, state for set will uh, create a replacement pod for you. Uh, knowing those limitations, uh, different people starting writing their own state for set imp implementations using CRDs. Uh, and these CRDs are usually uh, per application. One example for all, uh, CNPG means Cloud Native Postgres Operator, and it knows how to scale up Postgres correctly, it knows how to scale down Postgres correctly, and do other Postgres stuff that's suitable for their databases. So we know how to run multiple replicas of, a same, of the same uh, pod. Now we want to spread these replicas among sites. For that, we have pod topology spread constraints, which is a feature in scheduler. It is kind of hard to describe uh, in words. Uh, as everything in Kubernetes, it works with, with labels and selectors. Uh, this field in a pod tells scheduler to keep a balance of pods with elastic label among site, uh, among topology domains. Topology domain is a label on a node. It's easier to describe in a picture. I have a cluster stretching over three sites. There is no elastic running. Scheduler gets the first elastic pot. It doesn't, and it picks randomly some node, for example, site B, in, in site B. Uh, one interesting hap thing that happens not related to, to, to pot topology spreading, but dynamic provisioning usually happens after scheduling. So this is the first elastic pot. 
it doesn't have a bound volume yet. Scheduler puts it on the side, and the CSA driver provisions the volume in that side, which is very convenient. But back to spreading. Uh, when a new elastic cup pod comes, scheduler looks at uh, all the sides, all the nodes. It sees there is elastic pod running in site B. It sees that there is none on site A, site C. So it will pick one of site A or one node in site A or site C. For example, C. Another pod comes, and now scheduler has the only option to put the pod into site A. Site A. This is what topology spread domain uh, stop. Pod topology spread constraints do. Uh, it will keep the balance. Scheduler has the only option to put it inside. A. And you can only hope you have enough CPU, you have enough memory, you have your priorities set right. Because if there is no room inside A, this pod will be unschedulable. So this is how you spread uh, pods among domains or sites or whatever it zones. But after uh, the dynamic provisioning happens, uh, I have said the storage is typically local to the site, local to the availability zone in cloud. And after provisioning happens, a CSI driver together with Kubernetes put a node affinity into the persistent volume, which says which node can access that volume. Again, showing a picture, I have now four sites. Uh, my elastic dies, or I need to upgrade it, or whatever. Without the topology dom knowledge, schedule could put it into site D. However, the volume is in site A, and that volume would not be mountable. What node affinity does, it puts a, this is a selector, this is not a label, this is a selector for a node. Uh, and with this information, scheduler knows I need to put all the pods to site A that need that volume into site 8, and it will put it into site 8. You can see this topology spreading. It spreads things around. Node affinity keeps, keeps them in the same place. They work against each other. Uh, topology spreading is great uh, for stateless pods and for the initial deployment, when the storage is not yet bound. It will spread things around. But once the storage is provisioned, Node affinity is very, very sticky. You can paint yourself in the corner very easily. Is it easy now? <laughs> is it simpler? OK, so key takeaways. Free site is kind of a de facto uh, type of architecture. Yan runs through a multiple built-in that you can use from your uh, stateful set definition to ensure that you're going to spread your, um, your um, PVs and workload accordingly. So this is the main takeaway. Free site, use built-ins. As much as you can, you know, in this cloud-native world, use the uh, replication capabilities and high availability that are backed into the application. So this is uh, the longer you can go with the app, the better it is. Number three is about the application constraint as well. So we haven't touched base a lot on this yet, but um, my previous job, for example, I was working with telemetry. And it was OK to lose a, a bit of data here and there. Uh, and so depending on what you do, you can afford to lose a certain amount of data or your service for a little bit of time. Now the question comes is, what if my application cannot backed in the replication. So, you know, I woke up the other night thinking I'm in 2004 because everybody at Dell's booth and outside is talking to me about virtualization. The market being what it is, um, people and company organization are using more and more Kubernetes as a virtual machine scheduler. And so it's quite different from an application to uh, schedule a VM. Uh, number one, the big difference with regard to what uh, Yan drives us through is that the virtualization layer won't replicate the data itself. So we have to rely on the infrastructure to do that job for us. Second big challenge is the scale. So within, uh, not to call them out, within VMware, uh, usually you have one data store, one block device that's going to serve many VMs with many virtual disks. In KubeVirt project, 
aka running virtual machine from Kubernetes, you're going to have for each VM, each virtual disk, one PV, one uh, person volume. So that leads to, of course, a crawl in terms of number of volume you're going to have to create and consume. With uh, Kubevirt Project VMs, you also want to be able to live migrate your virtual machine from one node to another, which mandates you to have read write mini access, concurrent access from multiple nodes onto the same device, um, block device or volume. And yeah, going back to my constraints, within the next uh, couple of slides, we're going to go through different type of cube architecture using some, some, some keywords here, RPO. Who knows what RPO stands for? Okay, okay, quite a few. So for those who don't know, RPO is a recovery point objective, and it's basically the amount of data you can afford to lose. So in my example with my telemetry database, you know, I could afford to lose five minute data instead. RPO zero means, no, I don't want to lose any kind of data points. It comes also with this recovery time objective, which is the, okay, that's fine, I don't lose any data, but how long can I afford to not serve my service? So, for example, when I'm doing my uh, PostgreSQL failover, I'm going to have RTO, RPO zero, but for the time to reroute the connection, I can, you know, have an outage of uh, several seconds, let's say. So the first kind of infrastructure, Cuban infrastructure we go through is what we name Metro Disaster Recovery. It's basically the ultimate goal here, RPO zero, no data lost, RTO zero, no outage of my virtual machines. So usually you're gonna end up having uh, my, my free sites, business as usual, uh, with worker nodes on site A and B, but both access to the same pool, same storage, and replicates the data active-active uh, onto the two sites. So my VM is there. I'm writing stuff on my PVCs. It goes active-active to the two sites. And a bit like uh, in my earlier example, even for the storage, usually you're going to have a witness to uh, ensure a core. Uh, so with that, you know, if a site dies, the VM will be rescheduled automatically, and anyways, the path, multipathing, underlying, will take care of um, pushing the I.O. Within the cloud, it works pretty much the same. You know, cloud provider offers you some kind of shared storage, usually through NFS. Uh, it comes with also certain constraints with NFS. You know, you have to deal with certain permissions, uh, some different NFS, the number of NFS sessions can be also limited. And within cloud, it can also be, uh, be a little bit expensive. But long story short, don't do this. You know. <laughs> if you are in the cloud, in public clouds, you already have very good uh, services to, to, to have virtual machines. And this is probably not what you want to do there. The next type of architecture is branded here, uh, regional disaster recovery. The storage itself will have different, instead of writing the data in parallel, active, active on the two sites, you have different options. So synchronous replication, for example, which means we won't lose any kind of data, RPO zero, great. But to recover my service from one place to another, it can take a little bit more time. Asynchronous replication is here, it means that instead of having my um, RPO recovery point objective of zero, it will be greater. It will depend on the underlying storage, how often it replicates the, the blocks, basically. And RTO can also be longer. And the, the, the third uh, case is here, which I'm not going to explore into that talk, with, uh, is with backup and restore. Everybody has a good backup and restore procedure, I'm sure. <laughs> So the RPO here will be much longer, possibly. And to re rebuild entire clusters, uh, it can also take longer. So in this case, I have two sites with different clusters. Um, Severed cluster, as I name them, um, where basically when I have a outage here, I'm going to move entire workloads from one cluster to another. Um, behind the scene, the, the, the storage fabric will use synchronous or asynchronous capability to uh, copy the data. But the PVCs, the volume themselves, they will be different. You know, a volume that lives in here is different than the volume that lives in there. So the big problem begins because you or <laughs> another third party tool will have to take care of this movement, move from my cluster A to my cluster B. 
Kubernetes itself is not really you know, aware of any kind of ex external cluster outside of itself. So in this, in this little slide, this is kind of a prototype of what we've been doing to deal with virtual machines, uh, regional DR. I have basically declared my uh, CRD, virtual machine, site A, virtual machine site B, within a Git repo. Uh, one will be running, the other will be post. I also have my storage class that creates what we name a replication group that maintains the status of the failover. And basically, doing a failover is to tell Argo CD, post virtual machines from site A, start on site B, and from, this is here my uh, custom work, uh, trigger the failover. So what was read-write becomes read-only, and what was read-only becomes read-write. So this is, this is a way to orchestrate that movement. So there are many other ways how to orchestrate this movement. One thing th that is in CNCF uh, landscape is open cluster management, which is a huge project to manage multiple clusters. Uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, it comes with a lot of CRDs, a lot of uh, things to do, uh, and it, is, it has a plugin architecture, and one of these plugins is Ramen DR, Ramen uh, Data Replication. A very brief introduction to Open Cluster Manager. I will not dive into details. It is a thing that you install in your Kubernetes clusters. It comes with a bunch of CRDs, and these CRDs allow you to manage other clusters. So this big cluster that manages others is called Hub Cluster, and in all the managed clusters, you install just uh, Open Cluster Management add-on. Not dive, diving into details, however, you can see this picture is very similar to what Florian showed. Uh, in a Hub Cluster, there is a, uh, oops, sorry, too early. Uh, there is open cluster management running with Argo. Argo does its thing. Uh, open cluster manager has a placement engine. It chooses managed cluster A to run the application, to run the virtual machine. Uh, and the storage gets provisioned in storage bay A in the managed cluster A. What RAM and DR does, it adds to the picture this arrow. RAM and DR will set up the replication to all the other sites. So when something bad happens, uh, uh, Argo, Open Cluster Manager, RAM and DR, they will fail over, and Raman will set up the replication back. So when the site A comes back, then uh, it, can, it has all the data. So uh, many ways how to do the same thing. If you go to the solution so showcase, they will sell you different kinds of these pictures. Pick your poison very carefully and do your testing. <laughs> <laughs> Is it simple now? Yeah. Uh, okay, key takeaways. All right, so here you can do uh, multi sites with stretch or severe cluster. So this is uh, fairly different and has a huge impact on your objective, RPO, RTO. Again, I'm saying this again use application built in uh, high availability capabilities as much as you can. And you know, in case of severe cluster and dependent cluster, you, there is not so much built in as uh, as into the standard of Cube. So it will be up to uh, somebody, third party, you guys, uh, to do all this orchestration. And the, my last takeaway will be to do your own test. You know, there are many corner cases and uh, pitfall that uh, that comes with uh, storage management especially when it comes to non-container uh, workloads, so do your own test, that's the best. That's a wrap, so we are opening it to questions now. Yes. For the third site witness, what is the suggested latency for each CD um, latency between the other two sites? That's a great question. So basically, in ETCD, the latency can be fairly high, but I would recommend you <laughs> check with your Kubernetes distribution. So uh, in OpenShift, for example, I think it's only 10 milliseconds. No, I think it's 50. 50? 50 milliseconds. But 
It depends also on the cluster size, on the load, on many different things. It also depends on the bandwidth, so test very carefully before you scale. <laughs> Any other questions? One last one. Thank all you right. all. Thank you. May I have a question? <coughs> okay. Yeah, you thought demonstrate this is um, pretty good, but I, I want your kind of opinion regarding <coughs> replication on kind of storage layer or application layer. What's your thoughts? What's your reputation for? general workloads. I'm sorry, that's, I missed the beginning. Can you say that yeah, again? There's two ways to ensure the data can be replicated. The something can be done on storage layer, and something can be done on application layer. So from your experience, what's your general guidance for common workloads between application replication and storage replication? So yeah, the, the key takeaways was to do as much as you can with the application, because within the you know, 12-factor manifesto, it's supposed to be a consumable service that comes with its own uh, state and reliability. So just go with the storage replication when you have no other choices. That's my uh, go-to guideline here. Yeah. You agree on that?